with you all. Uh, my name is Duncan Wood. I've got my Aston Finch hat with you. Everybody with their ravings and their Canadian traditions out there. Um, I'm wearing my Bucks hat today. It was a mistake. Um, I'm just recovering. I'm getting feeling back into one of my toes at least. So, uh, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is our first event of 2017, uh, and it's a particularly important one. Um, we are going to be focusing on the outlook for Mexico's economy. Uh, we have with us a very distinguished team from the International Monetary Fund. Um, we have a little bit of a gender imbalance here, gentlemen. I, I'm not quite sure <laughs> if David Hasselhoff was here, he would definitely be accusing of us of having an all-male panel. Um, but anyway, um, Mexico's economy is, uh, has been uh, impressive over the last 20 years and at the same time disappointing. Uh, it's one of those uh, interesting conundrums that uh, we always expect a little bit more of Mexico than it's able to deliver. Uh, but if we look at the, the history of the last 20 years, Mexico has uh, avoided the uh, seemingly, at least 20 years ago, perennial plague of the sexennial crisis. It's weathered international financial stability over the last 20 years, in particular the, the crisis of 2008-2009, where uh, Mexico experienced a rather dramatic drop in economic growth uh, that year, but then was able to bounce back um, very, very quickly. Um, Mexico has made impressive institutional changes, has adopted a fiscally conservative uh, approach to macroeconomic policy and public finances, uh, has curbed inflation. Hundreds of billions of dollars in foreign direct investment have come in. There's been the dramatic expansion of exports, of course, to uh, North American partners, but also far beyond. And a question that I've been asked a lot recently is you know, does Mexico have the opportunity to diversify its exports at this point in time when there are threats to uh, the, uh, the North American relationship? And the fact is that Mexico has already diversified its exports uh, to a certain degree. Not as much as many people would like to see, but it has been successful, at least partially, in doing so. Um, we've seen important participation by Mexico in the, uh, in the pillars of the international financial architecture. Um, uh, and the global economic architecture as well. Uh, Mexico, however, faces a complicated outlook for this year. Uh, growth continues to disappoint and fails to meet expectations. As I said earlier on, we're kind of used to that by now with Mexico. Um, but this year and next, it matters a great deal because of the electoral impact that we have to look forward to in 2018. And now, of course, we have the uncertainty that have come with the changes that have been predicted in economic relations with the United States uncertainty over the future of NAFTA, uh, the question of the border tax, the weakness of the peso. Uh, we also have protests in Mexico over the uh, past few days over energy prices. And there's an overall feeling of the, the end of the sexenio, which is peculiar because, of course, we still have just under two years to go in this particular administration. We thought that this would be a great time uh, to provide an expert perspective on the state of Mexico's economy through the presentation of the findings of the 2016 IMF Article 4 report. I'm sure that many of you in this room understand what Article 4 consultations are, but just to give you a brief uh, uh, idea, country surveillance is an ongoing process that uh, individual, uh, sorry, that culminates in regular comprehensive consultations with individual member countries, uh, with discussions in between as needed. The consultations are known as Article 4 consultations because they are required by Article 4 of the IMF's Articles of Agreement. During an Article 4 consultation, an IMF team of economists sitting here in front of you, our distinguished guests, uh, visits a country to assess economic and financial developments and discuss the country's economic and financial policies with government and central bank officials. IMF staff missions also often meet with parliamentarians and representatives of business, labor, unions, civil society, academia, etc. I'd like to express uh, my deepest thanks to, uh, to, to Rob Renhack sitting beside me uh, and to his colleagues for agreeing to do this presentation today. Um, I'd like to thank also my colleague and uh, Mexico Institute Deputy Director Chris Wilson for agreeing to comment on the report at the end of the presentations, and to you all for being here uh, to participate in the dialogue, and we will have a time for uh, at the end of the presentation to actually engage in Q&A. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass the, uh, the microphone figuratively over to Rob, and uh, you can introdu introduce uh, the report and the two other speakers that we'll have here today, Fabian Valencia and Alexander Clem, who will be presenting the report. And then the other authors of the report who are sitting here will be here to respond to questions and engage in the dialogue. Robert, over to you. Uh, let me just briefly say uh, thanks for coming. Um, we're happy to be here. I think um, 
it's an interesting time for Mexico. Um, I think uh, Duncan did a nice job explaining what our Article 4 reports were about. Uh, this report was prepared really in October, and we went to Mexico in late September after they presented the budget to Congress, and we had a lot of documentation to understand their policies, what they were thinking about uh, for the coming year and the coming two or three years. And so our recommendations are sort of long-term recommendations, things I think they need to do, um, independently of the trade policy that the U.S. might adopt. Um, obviously, since the election of the U.S., the trade policy of the U.S. may be changing. That might throw some uncertainty into the outlook. But a lot of the policy recommendations we're making, I think, would still be true, even if the trade policy of the U.S. were not going to be changing. Um, we need to introduce the other members of the team. Uh, Kostas Christou is the new mission chief. Zora Yakova was the mission chief, uh, and she moved on to the European Department. Kostas came from the European Department. Damien Pui is also on the Mexican team. And then uh, Fabian will kick it off by explaining just the background, uh, how we saw the Mexican economy, and then Alex will go into the key policy messages that we were given. So without further ado, Fabian, please. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. So I'm going to start by giving you a brief overview of how we saw the state of macro in Mexico in the context of the Article 4. Let me start by highlighting that a real G economic activity in Mexico over the past uh, few years, as you see in the first chart, has continued to expand at a modest but a stable rate of around uh, 2 to 2.5%, uh, with contributions from the services industry uh, offsetting weakening, weakening manufacturing activity and contraction in mining, mainly because of declining oil production. Stable growth rates in GDP have come in hand with a steady and stable job creation, uh, as you see in the right-hand chart, particularly in the form formal sector, that have also uh, contributed to a significant decline in the unemployment rate uh, to levels that we hadn't seen since the years prior to the uh, global financial crisis. And this performance is actually, um, uh, you need to take into account all the external shocks that the global economy suffered during this period with a collapse in oil prices, uh, repeated uh, bouts of volatility in global financial markets, for instance, in, in earlier uh, uh, 2016. With the stable growth, we've also seen inflation remaining close to the target uh, uh, over the past uh, year and a half, uh, or two years, more or less. Uh, infl headline inflation was very close to the permanent 3% uh, target uh, that Manpico has. Uh, recently, uh, it has been uh, uh, increasing. Uh, this is because uh, the, the currency has depreciated sharply over the last three years, partly as the flexible exchange rate has helped the economy adjust to the external shocks that the economy and all the global economy in general experienced over the past few years. This uh, uh, depreciation is now starting to show uh, more clearly in the inflation rate and also in the expectations of where inflation is going to go next year by analysts. Uh, but these are expected to be temporary increases in inflation and not a, 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 a trend increase in, in inflation rate. An aspect that we have uh, mentioned in previous Article 4s is that we noted that public debt in Mexico had been steadily increasing over the past 10 years, over the past uh, 10 years, and in particular, for instance, since 2010, adding over 10 percentage points of GDP at a pace and level that was uh, exceeding what we saw uh, for peer countries, other countries with compatible ratings and also other emerging markets. However, fiscal consolidation has begun. The uh, authorities have announced a plan of reducing the fiscal deficit from 4.7% that we saw in 2014 to 2.5% uh, by 2018. This year, is exp or, or 2016, uh, the deficit was is expected to, to uh, reach 3% of GDP and remain at similar level in uh, uh, 2017. Uh, we also noted that there were low financial vulnerabilities in Mexico. The banking system remains uh, profitable uh, and well capitalized, with capital adequacy ratios hovering around 15% well above the 10.5% minimum, uh, regulatory minimum in Mexico. 
And the corporate sector also appears healthy with uh, corporate debts uh, remaining relatively low uh, compared to peers uh, in comparison with other emerging markets and stable relative to say uh, uh, ye recent years. The dot in the chart shows you the 2010 levels and you can see that uh, corporate debt, non-financial corporate debt has increased only modestly uh, over the past uh, few years. We also noted that appetite by foreign investors on, Amer on Mexican assets remains solid. Uh, ho holdings of foreigners, uh, by foreigners of long-term government securities denominated in local currency remain stable, as you can see in the, in the left chart. Uh, and spreads on external debt remains also uh, low relative to other uh, emerging markets, increasing in recent months due to, to the recent increase in volatility, but uh, in relative terms still low nonetheless. So with this, in this context, the Mexico confronts the recent increase in volatility from a position of a strength. Uh, so what was the outlook uh, that we saw for Mexico in the context of the Article 4? Well, we expected the economy to strengthen further uh, in the near term, helped by a strengthening U.S. economy, and in the medium term, uh, by the effect of the agenda of structural reforms that the government is implementing uh, over the past few years. Uh, as you saw, um, some of you may be aware, uh, Mexico is in the process of implementing an ambitious agenda of, of structural reforms since the last uh, four years or five, including in the areas of energy, education, telecommunications, uh, labor markets, uh, fiscal, uh, financial uh, competition, uh, to, to, to name the, the main, and, and their effect is expected to lift potential growth in the medium term. In the context of the report, we also highlighted that this outlook uh, was subject to important downside risks. The main ones were an increase in protectionist tendencies that could actually disrupt trade and financial flows in the coming years. Weaker than expected global growth, in particular US, if the US economy uh, doesn't strengthen as expected, then of course, given the strong ties between Mexico and their northern neighbor, uh, that would impact Mexico possibly significantly. Renew volatility in global financial markets as the episodes, uh, risk of episodes we saw, for instance, in early 2000. 16 could actually lead to a uh, pullback of capital flows from emerging markets, including, including Mexico. And a lower than expected path for oil prices and oil production, which uh, has been already on a decline since uh, the mid-2000s, could also uh, affect uh, the economy. But as you can see, most of the risks that we identified to Mexico's outlook were uh, external. Now, this was our view at the time of the Article 4 consultation, but since then, of course, downside risk have increased. We are uh, we're going to be publishing our own updated projections in a few weeks, but this gives you an idea of what market analysts are, analysts are thinking uh, for Mexico's uh, for the growth in Mexico for this year. Back in October, uh, uh, consensus forecasts were showing an average of growth for about 2.3 and that has now come down to 1.7. And these increased downside risks are reflected also in the behavior of asset prices that we have seen since, uh, since last November with the exchange rate for the peso vis-a-vis uh, -vis the dollar depreciating about 15%, uh, sovereign risk spreads increasing about uh, in about 40 basis points and the stock market declining uh, in about 5%. So with this, with this overview on the state of macro and outlook, I'm going to give you now to the floor to Alex, who is going to discuss policy priorities. Yeah, thanks very much. So I spoke this week about uh, policy priorities. I start with fiscal policy. Uh, my colleague Fabian already told you about the uh, rising debt ratio, and the d rising debt ratio is really driving the medium-term fiscal policy. So Mexico needs to do something to uh, stabilize the debt ratio and put it on a downward path. And as a result of that, fiscal consolidation is unavoidable for the next two years. Now, the reason they were able to remain 
maintain credibility, even though the debt ratio shot up over the last three years, was that already in 2013 they announced a path for deficit reduction, a path that, mm, I think Fabian mentioned it, that every year reduces the fiscal deficit by 0.5 percentage points of GDP, and they have broadly stuck to this path, and if they continue delivering on that path, the deficit will fall to 2.5 percent of GDP in 2018. Um, if anybody is confused by these numbers, let me also stress that sometimes in the press in Mexico other numbers are floating around because there are many fiscal deficits being used. So when we say fiscal deficit, we mean the broadest possible concept, which is called public sector borrowing requirement uh, in uh, the Mexican press sometimes. So this includes um, the central government, Pemex, uh, and everything else, except for the states. Now. Uh, in addition to this uh, path that we have for the next few years, we made some recommendations on what they should do. Uh, one is if there's a revenue surprise, in that case they should ideally save that and reduce debt further. Uh, you might wonder why should there be revenue surprises? Well, there are many reasons. One is oil prices could go up, but another revenue surprise we've seen in the past is that the Bank of Mexico has sometimes had huge surpluses. Um, whenever the currency depreciates, they make uh, gains on their dollar holdings, and by law they have to transfer some of those to the federal government, and this is uh, one of those examples. Also, we advised them that to look at faster uh, or further consolidation after 2018, because a deficit of 2.5% of GDP, it would probably stabilize the debt ratio. Probably, it depends a bit on your growth assumptions, but given the high level of debt, very high compared to other countries of a similar rating, uh, it would be more prudent to reduce it further. Uh, another important aspect of fiscal consolidation is Pemex. Pemex, as you probably all know, is the oil company. It is fully integrated into the budget in Mexico. So it is a public enterprise, but because we monitor the public sector, including the public enterprises, it is part of the fiscal deficit that we talk about. Um, they have obviously come under pressure with much lower oil prices over the last few years, and even though the government is partially protected through a hedge they have, the company itself is not. Um, the good news is that they published a business plan in November 2016 with very concrete suggestions on what to do, you know, more farm outs, which means cooperation with the private sector. Uh, so hopefully this will be implemented and successful. Finally, we made some recommendations that were meant to address the long-term issue of maintaining credible policy. So some recommendations to improve the fiscal framework. Uh, one example would be to create a non-partisan fiscal council. There is already some sort of council floating around, but it's not sufficiently independent and it doesn't have a very clear mandate, um, or not a very broad mandate. Um, we also thought, um, the public uh, deficit uh, limit, it should be more closely linked to some desired debt path. Currently, while it's very welcome that we have a multi-annual deficit target, the number itself comes a little bit out of nowhere. Um, yeah, I'll, the rest is um, some smaller things, how to deal with uh, emergencies, how to define an emergency when you can deviate from your fiscal rule, and once you have deviated from it, how do you make sure that uh, you go back to uh, the deficit that should apply under normal circumstances? Uh, let me now talk about monetary policy. On the monetary policy front, we have seen already a lot of action. Uh, you can see the blue line, that's the policy rate. It used to be at 3%, which is uh, very low for an emerging market, and for Mexico, I think, an all-time low. And over the last uh, one and a half years, it has been increased and it's now close to um, close to 6%, 5.75. So this is an enormous tightening. Um, why, are, why are they doing this? I mean, there are many reasons. Around the world, interest rates are coming up and of course Mexico is affected by that too. But also inflation is coming up. I guess you all know that the Mexican peso has depreciated dramatically over the last two years. Interestingly, for a long time, we didn't see it in inflation at all. So the pass-through from the depreciation to the inflation has been very, very limited. Uh, so the red line here gives you the one-year ahead inflation expectations, and they really, over the last two years, they haven't really moved very much. 
If you look at the last few months, however, they're coming up. Now, we should remember, however, that this is a short-term measure. Of course, if you have a massive uh, depreciation, then the prices of tradable goods are going to go up, and this is, is going to have an impact on the price level. But as long as the prices of non-tradables, of domestically produced goods, does not increase, as in other words, if there are no second round effects, no imitation of this, we shouldn't be, not be so worried because it would be just temporary. It would be just an adjustment in relative prices and it will wash out. And indeed, you can see that the long-term inflation expectations which are represented by the green line, they have not come up very much. They're still very stable. And that gives uh, the Mexican government actually, or uh, the central bank room, they don't need to increase as much as they otherwise would have if they see inflation coming up, right? Because inflation is going to go probably above the 4%, which is the upper limit of their tolerance band. But it's going to be a temporary thing. Let me now talk about exchange rate policies. Mexico has a very open uh, capital market and a flexible exchange rate policy. So there is no uh, particular target for any rate or any rate of change. Uh, and the exchange rate has played so far the key role of being a shock absorber, and it should play this role in the future too. Still, we have seen significant interventions in the last few years. Um, and particularly, in 2015, uh, there was a very active intervention program. It was a rules-based program uh, made up of various rules. One was that whenever there is a depreciation of more than 1% per day, then on the following day, there would, or on the same day, there would be an intervention of a pre-announced amount, 100 million, I mean, it changed over time. Um, this, as you see, cost them quite a lot of money, $24.5 billion spent in one year. That's the total of all the various programs. Then in the 2015 Article 4, which is the report before the current one, uh, we recommended a reduction or a phase out of these. And indeed, they were phased out. And in 2016, you see, there was much, much less intervention. Um, indeed, on February 17th, 2016, they announced that they would stop these rules-based policies and instead use only discretionary intervention and only on rare occasions. So you can see there's two billion of discretionary intervention. That was basically what happened on February the 17th, and then never again, except last week. <laughs> so the idea is, going forward, uh, they can use discretionary, and they should use discretionary intervention as a tool to ensure that markets function normally. So whenever the central bank has information that markets are either drying up or at the risk of drying up, or becoming erratic, or that there is a buildup of one-sided bets because everybody thinks that nothing is going to happen, then they can use that and intervene. But still, there is, there is and there should not be any specific exchange rate target, and it would be pretty hopeless to um, defend a given target. Okay. Let me now speak a little bit about the financial sector assessment program. So this is not annual. This is something we do in the in the um, important economies every five years. So this happened together with the Article 4 in 2016 in, in, in Mexico. It's, it was a focused FSEP, so we didn't look at absolutely everything. But it does have a section uh, where there are stress tests on the banking system and also um, sensitivity analyses of uh, non-financial corporations in Mexico. And the result of these tests is that uh, these institutions are all very resilient to shocks. Uh, specifically in the case of uh, financial institutions, they are so highly capitalized that even though we could ex uh, assume quite extreme shocks in terms of interest rate movements, exchange rate movements, uh, they didn't uh, create uh, any major problems. Another thing that this financial sector assessment program does is it looks at regulation. It looks at possible areas for development. And there we made some concrete suggestions on what Mexico could do to improve financial sector regulation. Uh, some of this is, is rather, rather technical, but let me just give a few examples. 
So one idea would be to strengthen the independence of uh, supervisors. Um, currently, the Ministry of Finance plays a major role in all of them. Um, also, um, there are multiple supervisors. Maybe it, they could be stronger if they were uh, joined together. Um, and some of them have multiple mandates, so they may have to have to develop the financial sector and also be responsible for financial soundness. And we suggest that financial soundness should really be the primary mandate. Anything else should come afterwards. Um, then we made some uh, other, I mean, just I, want, I don't want to go through the whole list here, but I will just give you one more example. There is the deposit insurance fund. Um, the deposit insurance fund has a lot of legacy debt still related to the old crisis from 95 so that when people pay fees on their bank accounts, part of these fees don't actually go to build up a fund to protect deposits, but instead to pay this legacy debt. So the recommendation was shift this debt to the general government debt because it's a general issue and not related to today's deposits. <laughs> or on development banks, uh, some of them, no, not all of some of them, all of them, they have targets, uh, targets on how much uh, debt they should create every year. And uh, in the opinion of this report, this is a bit dangerous, so they should move away from this and instead uh, have a target based on financial development or, or something that is more closely linked to what they were uh, created for. Fine, no? Wrong sign. Finally, let me come to structural issues in Mexico. It's last slide because if I had started with this, I would never have finished. Um, Fabian already mentioned the impressive set of reforms that were, have taken place in 2013 and 14. Um, so the main ones were the energy reform where for the first time in 70 years private investment in the energy se sector was made possible. Uh, but very important is also the telecommunications reform where they have addressed the previous uh, monopolistic structures financial reforms, labor market reforms, and education reforms. Fabian already mentioned a little bit about the impact, but let me say a few more words about that. So, for example, the, the energy reform, maybe it was bad luck to have timed it, or not, not to have timed it, but to have done it and then to have faced falling energy prices immediately afterwards. Otherwise, maybe the reaction in terms of investment or interest would have been stronger. But impressively, still the reform is going ahead. Uh, implementation is going ahead. Oil fields are being offered uh, and experiences are being made. So in the long run, it, it should bear fruits. The telecommunication reform has also has had important effects, especially on inflation, because the price for telecommunication goods has services has come down. Um, Arguably, this has even allowed the central bank to have a more relaxed monetary policy because there was less inflationary pressure. Um, and finally, the labor reform also has improved flexibility of the labor market, although there still remains a lot to be done. Um, as Fabian mentioned, this, this whole set of reform is expected to uh, boost potential growth over the medium term. But continued implementation is crucial. So all of them are continuing. The oil reform continues. They continue every few months to offer new oil fields. So this should not stop. It should continue over the next few years. And then finally, of course, major bottlenecks remain. Um, as everybody knows, security and the rule of law is a major issue that has to be addressed. Um, in some parts of the countries, it's more urgent than in others. Uh, the quality of judicial institutions is also still very far from imperfect. That makes it hard to enforce contracts or just to enforce your rights. Um, then uh, we have looked in this last report particularly at female labor supply and at reasons why it is so low, not only compared to advanced economies but also compared to peers. Um, and finally, for various reasons, it will be important to address the high rates of poverty and inequality. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alex and Fabienne and, and Robert. I'm going to turn the microphone over to, uh, to my colleague, Chris Wilson, uh, who will give us some comments on this, and then we will come back and uh, engage in some conversation.
Great. Thank you very much, Duncan, and thanks to all of you. It's a great report. First of all, I just want to congratulate you and, and thank you again for joining us here at the Wilson Center to discuss it. Um, you know, before jumping into any of the challenges facing Mexico's economy and that have emerged in clearer form since the, the first publishing of the report, I think it is worth, again, highlighting, which is something that has been already highlighted, which is the very sound macroeconomic management that Mexico has uh, managed to, to maintain for, you know, many years now, for, for well over a decade now. Uh, and we see in this report many of the fruits of that consistent sound management. Uh, I think a, you know, a country such as Mexico that really is such an open economy, uh, you know, if, if it, you know, I in the face of so many external challenges, such a complicated environment really since the global financial crisis, you know, many countries could have fallen into, if they were faced with the same challenges, into a full-blown crisis. Uh, but Mexico, as a result of this uh, stability and sound economic management has been able to avoid that type of, uh, of, a, of a scenario. Uh, additionally, the structural reforms of 2012 to 2014 have begun showing some signs of real success, particularly in telecoms and energy. Um, and while economic growth has only been moderate, again, I think that for, for many years now in Mexico, I think that this should be seen in the face of the external environment that the country has been, been facing. And a point that I want to jump into in a little bit more detail that I think is, is really impressive is the fact that re inflation remains so well anchored despite the depreciation of the peso. Uh, this has been one of the, the big wins, I think, of the, the stability and the, the macroeconomic management that I was discussing there. And so in, on that point, I wanted to jump in a bit more and, and offer a comment and a, a question for our panel here as well. Um, We've noted that the ex flexible exchange rate has worked very well as an adjustment mechanism for Mexico's economy, uh, that medium-term inflation expectations remain well anchored. Uh, but as you also mentioned, in the last several years, there were two it was sort of one-off factors that were supporting that in significant ways. The decline in telecom prices as a result of the reform and the, the major fall in energy prices that did impact energy prices domestically, even as they were uh, you know, without, not fully liberalized. Um, so those, you know, as one-offs that supported low inflation uh, are not going to be there in the future. Um, and I think you, in the report, offered a perhaps optimistic assessment that the country would be able to not raise interest rates, that the, the central bank would have the flexibility, uh, given the well-anchored inflation, to hold off on interest rate rises. But of course, in the, in the coming <laughs> uh, events following the publishing of your report, the central bank has felt the need to make significant increases, significant tightening of monetary policy. And so I guess I, I'm interested if you could go into a bit more detail of you know, the, to what extent you think Mexico uh, you know, I is still well positioned to, uh, to weather depreciation without having significant concerns regarding inflation. Or, or is whether or not maybe the external environment has gotten to the limits of confidence in the central bank's ability to, to keep prices well anchored. Um, on, a, on a separate point, uh, I think the, there was one small graph in the report that grabbed my attention, which was the breakdown of you know, where growth was coming from uh, over the past several years. And one of the, the real consistent drivers of growth uh, is private domestic consumption. Uh, you mentioned it in the report as one of the, as, as the main driver over the last year, uh, but looking back in the, the charts, uh, it seems that that could more or less be, be true over the last, you know, really since the global financial crisis. Uh, and I just offer this as a comment because I think at a time like now where there's so much uncertainty regarding Mexico's external economy, its trade, its engagement with the world, it's a good time to reflect on the fact that increasingly the domestic economy is what's driving growth in Mexico. And that, you know, while of course it makes so much sense that Mexico is very focused on its relations with the United States, its trade relations with the United States, uh, that certainly shouldn't be done, uh, you know, at, at, at while letting go of any of the domestic e issues. The, the point that I wanna make is just that in this moment of such uncertainty internationally, uh, it's actually more important than ever that Mexico be following through 
uh, to ensure that domestic consumption, the domestic economy, efficiency gains are made there, and that that continues to be a driver of growth uh, in the years to come, despite some of the external challenges that it's facing. And then finally, uh, maybe raise another point for discussion uh, and yeah, be a, a bit more provocative on this one. The IMF in its report recommended the removal of price controls in gasoline, you know, something that the government has just done uh, or just taken a significant further step to, to do. Uh, and it has, of course, been met with huge political resistance, you know, blockades in the streets, uh, long lines at gas stations, all sorts of, of impacts that we're seeing right now. Uh, you know, this is something that the IMF uh, has a history with, not in this sense, you know, not in the, in, in the way that it's playing out here. This is not a structural adjustment package. This is not being mandated on the Mexican economy in any way. This is obviously a policy the Mexican government chose to pursue of its own volition. Uh, but, you know, as the International Monetary Fund has certainly given a lot of thought to the political and political economy ramifications of eliminating price controls and eliminating subsidies. Uh, I wonder if, if you do have thoughts about the best way to do that. One thing that struck me as I was reading the report is that you also recommend eliminating uh, subsidies and price controls regarding to electricity prices in Mexico. Uh, but in, in doing that, I think you made a very important point, uh, which is that you say we suggest uh, liberalizing that market for electricity prices but also at the same time place, putting in place social assistance programs for those that would be most hurt by such changes. Uh, I, I wonder if that uh, you know, is something that you know, perhaps is more difficult to do with gasoline price liberalization uh, or is perhaps a missing part of the way that it is being implemented right now. Uh, if you know, from some of the experience that the IMF has, you have thoughts about how to manage the political economy of such uh, challenging uh, measures that may be necessary from a, a purely economic standpoint, but are very challenging from a political economy standpoint. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, well, I'm going to give the panel a, a chance to, uh, to respond to, to Chris's comments right now. I'd like to throw in one of my own, which is, uh, uh, Alexander, you, you, rem you mentioned the impact of security and rule of law concerns in Mexico. It's an issue that we've struggled with here at the Mexico Institute over the years to try to quantify. Everybody says it has an impact and people speculate and people come up with, you know, certain ideas it costs us 2% of GDP per year, whatever it is, right? And the fact is the, the conversation never really seems to come to any real conclusion. It seems as though it impacts different parts of the country in different ways, it impacts different sectors in very different ways, it impacts different businesses in, in different ways. I wonder if you could uh, comment, in, in addition to re responding to, uh, to Chris's uh, comments there, respond uh, to comment on, on how security and the rule of law really does seem to impact the Mexican economy. And of course, Damian and Costas, you are, you're welcome to, to, to chime in here. So uh, I don't know who wants to, to lead off. Damian, you wanted to do uh, two questions. Absolutely. So let me actually start also with a with a pass through question that you mentioned. I mean, it, it is true that uh, in the first, I mean, the currency has started it started its depreciation since uh, uh, late 2014 when oil prices started falling, and that depreciation uh, coincided with the telecom reform that lowered uh, telecom prices first by eliminating long distance charges and also increased competition that offset more than offset actually the effect of the depreciation and inflation, leading to inflation actually to drop to historically low, le low levels in 2015. But what, what we did in the report was also an analysis of what, is, what explains the low pass-through in Mexico, controlling for the behavior of other factors that could actually affect inflation. Uh, and there were two elements that actually explain why Mexico had a low pass-through. One was the low import content of consumption and the credibility of monetary policy. And then we did a, a cross-country study uh, in, a, in a, um, a working paper that is now published that shows actually the countries with uh, credible monetary policies reflected in well-anchored inflation expectations in the medium term uh, are countries with also low pass-through of uh, the currency depreciation to inflation. And, um, and this low pass-through tends to be close to the import content of consumption. You may still have an important 
effect on inflation if, you, if your currency depreciates by a lot. I mean, the peso has depreciated about 50% since um, mid-2014. But this effect would actually just be the first round effect uh, that is natural to expect uh, and would actually be temporary and probably uh, that's what gives room to monetary policy to, to not react to it. Now, on the question of, of consumption, it is true. Consumption has been an important driver of growth over the past two years, a, a sport by, as I showed in one of the charts earlier in the presentation, a strong performance in labor markets with job creation remaining steady and employment falling uh, quite significantly. But also, this telecom reform may have increased a bit um, a disposable income that allow uh, consumers to, uh, to to increase uh, the purchase of other goods and services. The depreciation uh, may have also encouraged some consumers to bring forward the consumption of some durable goods whose prices were expected to, to increase uh, in the near term. Um, therefore, the robustness of consumption may, 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 may include also a temporary factor. Now, going forward, of course, whether it will remain robust or not, I mean, the conditions are there but we also have to factor in the increased uncertainty that could actually, and the, the increased uncertainty that is also reflected in a deteriorating consumer sentiment, as we see in recent data, that can actually affect uh, consumption uh, going forward. Okay, let me follow up a little bit still on the monetary policy question. So you asked, you know, has it reached its, its limit? Is there a reason for it to stop? So I think one thing we can do is we can look at the data. We can look at things like uh, inflation of uh, service, prices of services. Those are naturally a non-tradable good. And there, it, we have seen it's very stable at 3%, actually just below 3%. So as long as you don't see any uh, second round effects, you know, people asking higher wages to be compensated and this pushing up service prices, something like that, as long as you don't see this, I think there is room that is created by the credibility of the inflation uh, targeting framework. Um, of course, you know, we shouldn't overstress this point and be overconfident. We know the world is complicated. There might be multiple equilibria, and at some point, if the depreciation gets too strong, nobody trusts it anymore. We don't want to go there, right? So I can see why the authorities want to be a little bit more prudent than what is um, suggested purely by the analysis of domestic data, but they do not do need to do as much as they would have done in the past. Right? If you had had a meeting like this 20 years ago, probably everybody would have said, well, if you depreciate 50%, it's logical that the price level will come up 50% too, right? sooner or later. We are not in this world anymore. Uh, and this is what gives them room. Um, then you asked me this very difficult question about security. Uh, of course, we also, because we at the fund, we like to quantify everything. We really wanted to quantify it, but we cannot quantify it, right? You cannot say Mexico's GDP would be X percent higher if there were no security issues or if security issues were comparable to other countries. Um, but anecdotally, um, it must have enormous impacts and maybe even impacts on parts of the economy that may not be so important for overall GDP. So. For example, I suppose that if a foreign investor comes into Mexico, sets up a huge factory, they can protect it. Of course, that will add to the cost, but it's not going to be enormous. On the other hand, small businesses will suffer quite a lot. Right? It's, I mean, even opening a taco stand is a problem if you don't know whether you, there will be extortionary attempts, um, whether you, if you are successful, somebody will try to abduct somebody working there or living in your family. A and this is the type of thing that's holding back domestic investment and development in some parts of the country, certainly not in, in all or most parts of the country. If I ever quantify it more precisely, I'll let you know. Thank you. Let me just r add a few things on the monetary policy question. Um, they've raised rates by quite a lot, 300 basis points about a year ago, now it's at 575. So that's already a big increase, so it's worth seeing how that works with a lag on inflation and economic activity. And there is a trade-off that the more you raise rates, that will have a dampening effect on growth. And you need to be sure that you're not overdoing it on the inflation 
on the interest rate increases to meet your inflation target because the economy is already growing relatively slowly. So it's a matter of balance. Of course, it, the policy rate should not have stayed at 3 percent. That would be a huge mistake. So they've been right to raise them aggressively this year. The question is how much and the timing. And sometimes you get the sense that they're <coughs> reacting to the exchange rate change as opposed to the underlying inflation expectations. The communication has always been very clear that they're worried about the effect of the exchange rate change on underlying inflationary pressures going forward. So the communication is correct. But once again, um, it's just a matter of balance and how you communicate it and just bearing in mind that there may be temporary effects on inflation, not permanent, and that you have to think about the growth side of the equation as well. On the security question, it's very important and Colombia is a good example of a country that has improved the security situation quite a bit. In 2002, the FARC controlled about 20 percent of the country, and they've just signed a peace agreement, but they've made huge gains against the FARC over the last uh, 14 years. And growth has been stronger in Colombia. It's been certainly boosted by the improved security climate, but it hasn't been like – it didn't change growth from 3.5 to, say, 7 percent a year. Um, it certainly was a positive factor. Probably when you go back and do some studies, it was probably significant, but it wasn't totally transformational. So it's a very important reform to do. Um, it will improve investment, but it won't sort of make light years of different difference in a short period of time. Thank you. Um, we published a very interesting little paper last year by Viridiana Rios, which looked at the impact of um, violence, insecurity, on economic complexity in different regions of Mexico and the idea that um, if you had lower levels of violence, then local economies would actually be much more complex than they are right now because of precisely the factors that you mentioned, that some businesses, usually the bigger businesses, but also certain sectors are better able to weather insecurity than others. And so uh, you lose a lot of the smaller firms that might be uh, coming up, the entrepreneurial nature, et cetera. I'd like to open up the uh, the floor for uh, for questions right now. I've got one, two, and then uh, a three over there. Yes, please. Rafael Bernal with the with the Hill. Um, you you mentioned that service is sort of following up on on Chris's idea. You you mentioned that services are really driving growth, uh, but the um, the explicit threat from the incoming U.S. administration is specifically on manufactured goods. Is is that shift toward services and toward the internal market, is that enough to weather a storm with, uh, say, that there were a 35 percent tariff on, on manufactured goods coming into the United States from Mexico? Thank you. Let's take, should we take three questions from here? Thank you. Meg? Thank you. I wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on uh, your points about exchange rate policy and how they've been managing things. Uh, could you comment a little bit about um, Mexico's foreign exchange reserves? I mean, the point about the flexible exchange rate being a very, very powerful shock absorber and really helping the economy weather the ups and downs in, in uh, foreign exchange markets. Well, I think in the, this year we're probably going to have some more volatility, some more ups and downs uh, generally. And, of course, Mexico is still going to have its uh, foreign obligations. You know, it's not just its government debt, but also corporate debt. And, of course, then you have that play of, well, you can depreciate, but then it becomes much more expensive for the corporates and others, you know, to buy the foreign exchange. And then you also have Mexico looking at its overall level of foreign exchange. So I just welcome your comments on that, sort of the health of it. I know you look at it in terms of uh, the IMF's metric, and Mexico's always been – you know, very solid within, you know, the recommended ranges and uh, not really a worry. But, you know, just in terms of that's one of the key indicators market participants are going to be looking at. So a little bit of elaboration and, and the health of the corporate sector and their ability to weather these kind of fluctuations I think would be very useful. Thank you. Thank you. And the gentleman over here on the left, if you don't mind uh, getting him a microphone. Yes, thank you. And if you don't mind introducing yourself. Thank you. Jones with the University of Florida. Uh, I'm wondering if there are any prospects uh, for growth in Mexico to accelerate over the medium term to a point where it, it might uh, once again uh, uh, consider being able to join the ranks of, of developed nations. Great. So 
Let me start by answering, then I can pass it to Fabian and Alex. Um, on the tariff question, um, I guess our puzzle is it's not obvious exactly what the new administration would do. I mean, a 35 percent tariff is not good, obviously. Um, but it's not clear under what legislation they could do that in a way that minimizes the cost to the U.S. government of doing that. And maybe they w there might be a threat to do that, but then there'll be other things going on to sort of fine tune NAFTA. So until we know clearly what the administration, the new administration will say its policy will be, it's hard to know. Obviously, that's an adverse scenario. But maybe just there's increased uncertainty, and as Fabian mentioned in, in the slide, that that's already leading people to mark down growth in Mexico. So certainly we think there probably will be a period of uncertainty while people are deciding, both in Mexico and in the U.S., about how to deal with the issue that's been raised. Um, but the 35 percent tariff, obviously, not good. I, I don't have a number for you on exactly what it would do. Um, there are a lot of what ifs. For example, maybe the fiscal policy in the U.S. would be very stimulative. It would promote faster growth in the United States, which would help Mexico. But depending on what that fiscal package would look like, I don't know the growth number that would come out of that. So there are too many imponderables right now. On Meg's question on the vulnerabilities, um, they've got about $175 billion in reserves. That's very good. Then they could draw another $88 billion under our flexible credit line. So that gives them a total access to reserves of about 250, 260 billion, which is pretty good. And they've been, with the new intervention policy, they're, they're committing to use reserves and intervention in a very economical way. You know, last year they spent about two billion in uh, a discretionary intervention, and then that was it for the rest of the year. And then last week, they did some intervention. I guess tomorrow morning we'll know exactly how much it was. The market reports that it may be $2 billion, $3 billion, but not a huge amount. So it's a more efficient way to use your money and send a signal <coughs> to the market. Um, so f on the reserve side, they're in very good shape. And then the FSAP, which Alice can look at, and we've also looked at corporate vulnerabilities. It seems the financial system is pretty robust to exchange rate shocks or volatility in asset prices. And then we'll get to your question on what are the future sources of growth. That's a really good question. I don't, I don't have an honest answer. I don't know. I think that's where they need to really look and to diversify. Um, right now, they're very tied to trade with the U.S. It makes perfect sense given their location. Um, but maybe they need to diversify trading partners and find ways to get the manufacturing hubs in the northern part of Mexico to extend to southern Mexico and the other parts of Mexico. I think that's a huge challenge. I don't think we have a good answer for that. But you guys want to add your thoughts? Yeah, I would like to add just on this uh, question about reserves and the uh, uh, corporates in Mexico. So I think the central bank watches them very, very carefully. Most of the corporates that have large US dollar debts, they're typically hedged, either naturally, because they produce, uh, Pemex is actually one of the big issue of U.S. dollar debts, and all their revenues are in U.S. dollars too, so, so they are not really affected by that. And others are to some extent financially hedged. Uh, so it's something that we always have to keep watching, but there are no signs of major difficulties with the, with the corporates. Uh, no, just uh, on your question about the, the medium-term growth, I mean, Mexico, as I mentioned briefly, and Alex uh, reiterated on it, uh, Mexico is in the process of implementing a wide range of structural reforms. Uh, you know, we, we have an estimate of what the impact is going to be in the medium term. Uh, in the report, we mentioned that it's probably going to add about half a percentage point in GDP to, me to potential growth over the next five years or so. Uh, but there's still a lot of uncertainty about what the synergies among these reforms is going to do. Uh, that can actually uh, lead to even higher uh, a higher impact uh, down the road and uh, maybe even beyond uh, 2020 or 2021 with the telecom reform uh, increasing connectivity in the country access to broadband and to lower prices uh, the um, energy reform opening the sector that was uh, to, to private investment that will bring uh, new uh, know-how and technology spillovers to uh, other, on this other companies in the sector and, and, and the rest of the country. So we still f we first have to see what's the true impact of, of the 
the the current reforms uh, and and then you know resolve all the other bottlenecks that Mexico faces right now. You mind if I jump in and just add just a tiny bit to that? I mean, I think it's really important that we th there there is definitely a narrative that Mexico has been stuck in a slow growth trend and that its aspirations to reach developed country status have, have never materialized. And there's a lot of truth to that narrative. But if one also steps, takes a step back and looks at the transformation that has occurred of the Mexican economy over the last 20 to 30 years, it's also profound. I mean, this is a country that's gone from being a country that makes uh, shoes and t-shirts to one that makes cars and airplanes. That's a, that's a fundamental transformation of the driving force behind the Mexican economy. Uh, and so that is still in effect. I mean, we see that in terms of the manufacturing investments that are continued to be made in Mexico in terms of its success at changing itself into uh, a significant value add uh, manufacturing hub for the United States and for the world. Of course, there's some risks right now in terms of trade policy related to that, but it's significant. Something that we at the Mexico Institute have been focused a lot on is what is that next step? You know, if the, the previous transformation was from, you know, sort of low value add, simple good production to higher value add, more complex manufacturing, uh, what's the next step? And what it seems to be is it's a move into the knowledge economy. Uh, it's not just manufacturing and putting together products, but it's actually designing those products also in Mexico. And there happens to be a tendency to co-locate design and production uh, that many manufacturers across several product ranges are looking to do. And so Mexico as a manufacturing hub is well positioned to make that leap into uh, more research and design work, more innovation work. Uh, but there's also significant challenges to getting there. I mean, to do that, you really need to focus on your workforce, your, the education of your, of your country, uh, as well as the business climate around things like innovation. And so there's, you know, th there absolutely is a pathway to that next step. Uh, is it medium term in terms of the next five years or is it a longer term prospect? You know, maybe the latter, uh, but there's certainly, you know, even though there's so much talk of stagnation, uh, there's also quite a bit of transformation that's occurring, just maybe a little bit too slow for us to notice it day to day. Yeah, Mike, uh, no question by then. Uh, th thank you, it's all been very interesting. Mike Masetic, PBS Online News Hour. Uh, I don't know whether this falls within the range of your predictions, but is it too soon or to factor in what kind of effect the probable, likely, whatever you want to call it, victory of a left-wing populist in the presidential election is going to have on economic developments? And then my second question is, all the trade talk has been looking north. What about east? Uh, China's slowdown and the uh, perhaps death of the TPP. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, Gabriel Toledo from the George Washington University. I was wondering, uh, there was a lot of talk about uncertainty, and I wanted to know, uh, has there been a consideration, um, or do you believe it would be appropriate to implement a risk premium by the Mexico Central Bank in order to deal with all this uncertainty? Thank you. Thank you, do we have a third question? Yeah, over here on the right or the back, thank you. I thank you, Laura Rojas uh, from Nodum International. Um, I'm a consultant, uh, and uh, I was uh, wondering uh, about uh, um, the, the trade policy um, impact, um, given all the uncertainties, uh, but uh, I would like uh, to know which uh, sectors you think uh, will be more uh, impacted uh, by uh, those, uh, those measures and uh, what is the relationship uh, with the potential growth of the Mexican economy in the medium term? Fantastic. Yeah, let me just address the first set of questions here, and then if you could clarify what you were asking about the risk premium. On your questions um, on the prospects of electoral change in Mexico, you know, the elections will be in June of 2018, change of government in December of 2018, I think. So I think it's a bit premature to speculate what might happen. Um, so I don't want to comment on that. 
Um, and then on whether Mexico is looking east and the role of the TPP, um, our, our discussions with the government in Mexico indicated that the TPP was good for Mexico, but not you know a deal breaker. It wouldn't like enormously increase growth, but it was positive. Um, and we haven't yet heard whether they're like going to be trading more with China. China's growth obviously is always a factor that affects the world economy. Um, and so far, China's growth has been decelerating from the super high rates of years ago. And that has been a factor behind the decline in commodity prices. That has been a factor in the slower global growth that we've seen. Um, and now that Mexico is not really a commodity dependent economy, it's more insulated from those types of effects of China on commodity prices. But it certainly, to the, to the extent that China is a factor in global growth, that would affect Mexico as well. Um, what, could you repeat your question on the risk premium exactly? What was that? I was wondering if um, do you consider the central bank uh, should uh, issue risk premiums for Mexican assets uh, to deal with all the uncertainty that has arise of external factors in order to calm investors holding Mexican peso assets? Well, I mean, the risk premium is set by the market. So the market would set a price for the interest rate and the price of the bonds issued by the Mexican government. They would be setting the price for Mexican corporate bonds. And in there, they would be building in a risk premium that they would want in order to be compensated for any risk investing in Mexico. So the central bank doesn't have to do anything. They do need to keep inflation stable, and they do need to work with the government to maintain macroeconomic stability. And that's the way they can keep risk premia low. But in the end, it's the prices of these assets that are being set by the market. And so the, the central bank doesn't need to do any more than try to maintain macro stability. But that's a lot of work out already, so that, that's a big task. So Alex, Fabian, you guys want to comment and address the third question as well? Uh, no, actually, if, you know, going up, uh, going up, uh, adding a little bit on what Robert said, if in one of the charts I showed earlier, I showed how sovereign spreads have increased since November 2008. Uh, sorry, <laughs> since November 8, 2016. And, and that is in part a reflection of a risk premium the markets are pricing in, given the uncertainty that has happened since then. It has increased since then, no? Yeah, there was this question about what sectors would be most affected by changes in U.S. trade policy. Well, that depends again on what exactly U.S. trade policy will be, but I mean, what we have heard and read in places is sometimes uh, threats targeted specifically at the auto industry, which has been, which is a very important part of Mexican exports and Mexican manufacturing. So there is definitely a threat there, but it all depends on, on what happens. Um, if I can just uh, make a quick uh, response to, to Mike's uh, question about the move to the left in Mexico. One of the extraordinary things, and of course we have no idea what's going to happen in an election which is a year and a half away, but let's just suppose that there is a left-wing candidate that wins in Mexico. Let's, uh, let's say that it is Andres Manuel López Obrador, because he's the most likely person from the left to win. Well, there's certain things that he would be able to do, and there's certain things that he wouldn't be able to do, and that's why the reform agenda of the past few years has been so important because a lot of those reforms were actually constitutional reforms, which means that whoever wins the presidency in 2018, if they want to repeal those reforms, is gonna have to go through the same process that President Enrique Peña Nieto went to through to get them approved, which means that he's gonna need a two-thirds majority in both chambers of Congress and a majority of the state legislatures across the country to, ma to make that happen. It doesn't mean that that, that, uh, that person couldn't throw sand into the gears of the Mexican economy. Um, and the best example, I think, is on the energy front. You wouldn't be able to, or it's very unlikely you'd be able to repeal the energy reform, but what you could do is you could simply not f offer any more oil assets for, up for auction. That's one thing that you could do very, very easily. You can begin to change corporate tax rates, you can begin to make regulation more stringent, but a lot of those things are actually protected anyway and take a long time to work their way through. So I don't think that we should get too hysterical about the prospects of, for the Mexican economy if a left-wing candidate wins in Mexico. There's a lot in Mexico which is institutionalized now in ways that were, you know, to, to echo Chris, which were, which were unthinkable 20 years ago. Um, 
you know, I mean, even, I mean, the, the best example being the central bank, I think. But, you know, lots of things which have happened in recent years have helped to build upon that legacy. So I think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about Mexico long term. Tony. Hi, Tony Wayne from here at the Wilson Center. Going back to this prospect for medium term growth or long term growth, clearly the education reform is intended to facilitate long term growth. We can see in the first several years it's going to be a long term process to reform education. What about, do you all have any thoughts on the difficult time in expanding the formal sector or reducing the informal sector in Mexico, and also the challenges of increasing labor productivity. Um, you know, despite all of the investment and all of the production, it's been very hard to get those productivity figures growing, and a lot of debate and discussion on that in Mexico over, the, over recent years. Hi. Uh, uh, one question I would like to ask is also... Sorry, uh, could you introduce yourself, Miriam? Uh, Miriam Hassan, uh, Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, I would like to ask about remittances, uh, considering I know it's not a very big part of the GDP, still it has an impact in, in very important sectors of, of the poor and uh, parts of the country. So uh, can you comment about that? I mean, there are uh, speculations that one way Mexico would pay for the wall, if there's a wall, would be through remittances, <laughs> because there is a way to control remittances, apart from the fact that there could be deportations, and uh, certainly, uh, if not deportations, at least certainly uh, uh, the w Mexican workers in the US, US probably will go more into the shadows, will have more difficulty sending remittances, so certainly that will affect Mexico. So can you comment on that, uh, please? Thank you. Thank you. And do we have a third question on this one? If not, we will stop it. Okay. So let me just uh, say something on, on remittances first. I mean, they've been performing very strongly, as you know, in the past uh, year or so, I in part maybe explained by a strengthening U.S. labor market. Now, the question of what can they do with remittances uh, also depends on how much it can be enforced. I mean, if, if for some reason there would be a big tax imposed on them in order to, uh, s you know, finance the construction of a wall, then the question is how can they really enforce something like that? Because most likely what ha would happen is the remittances would go underground. And, and to the extent that that happens, and probably uh, you know, we would not be able to measure, I mean, uh, statistically it may look like they were going down, but probably they will not. So it's very, it's very difficult to know exactly what can be done feasibly that would actually affect dramatically remittances uh, uh, going from U.S. to Mexico. Especially, you know, as I say, we first need to know what would happen to the U.S. itself because if, if indeed, you know, U.S. starts growing more, then we probably would see an increase in remittances uh, above and beyond any policies uh, targeting remittances specifically, no? On the formality issue, uh, that is a big problem. For instance, uh, one of the discussions we've had with the authority is, is um, you know, there are these social programs, uh, for instance, uh, Prospera, which uh, uh, provides these conditional trans transfer programs to poor people. Uh, but one of the challenges is how to make sure that you graduate them from these, uh, from these uh, social assistance and eventually they, they become a part of the formal labor force uh, you know that that that's a that's a, I mean that's a challenge. Uh, I don't think they they have a good answer yet. But there are several possibilities that are in place that may help in that direction. For instance, uh, on the fiscal front, they have the the new system of small taxpayers that gives them some um, leniency over the first few years. Uh, the idea is to bring them under under the formal uh, sector so they start uh, filing taxes. Uh, this leniency will start decreasing over time and eventually once you have them in, they have also have enjoyed the uh, benefits of being in the formal sector such as access to credit, access to uh, other services and hopefully they will stay there. It would, it would be a process that would happen gradually. Uh, when the authorities uh, redesign Oportunidades into Prospera, they also added a dimension of job inclusion 
as or job market inclusion. I don't remember exactly how they call it, but they, the the idea is actually to bring the people, the beneficiaries of Prospera, into the formal job market and actually helping them to stay there. These are initiatives that are now in place. I mean, how quantitatively important they will be? Will you know they we need time to actually assess their effectiveness and whether they actually can. Uh, you know, be have an important quantitative impo in impact. No? Yeah, but I mean, to add something on this, it may or may not have been driven by these programs, but what we have certainly seen is that the share of labor employed formally has been rising you know, for the last three to four years almost steadily. Yeah, so there seems to be a development in the right direction. Nevertheless, if I remember correctly, it's still two thirds or more. It's informal, so it's just, there's still a lot to be done. Okay. Um, just to follow up there, is that related, do you think, to the labor reform of 2012? Is that because that, that was a reform that, came, was began, that took place before the Peña Nieto administration, but obviously was tied to the incoming administration as well as the outgoing Calderon administration. And the purpose of that reform was to make it easier to hire and fire generally. Um, which was supposed to bring more people into the formal sector. Do you see a, a direct impact from that reform? Well, we have spoken to labor economists in Mexico, and they all said the reform didn't go far enough. They, so they pointed out lots of for, uh, flaws. But it has done certain things successfully. So it has made it possible to hire people on short-term contracts, which made it possible for the first time to have things like internships, uh, and, and that must have had a positive impact on formal employment, where before you didn't even have a way of doing this legally or formally, so you had to do it either informally or not at all. So, so yes, but uh, I think there was consensus that much more needs to be done on labor market reform, especially on uh, the way it is enforced with the court system, which is uh, still very inefficient. Um, Damien uh, Costas, I don't know if there's anything that you guys would like to add at this point. I feel bad for having made you sit up here. Um, you know, we've got uh, enormous experience and uh, knowledge here, but uh, if there's, we'll, I guess we'll, we'll get people to interact with you afterwards. Um, it was uh, 21 years ago, uh, in January of, uh, of 1996, when I first pitched up in Mexico. And uh, one of the big issues at the time was what to do with the bank uh, debt or the, the bad debts from the banks um, after the financial crisis of 94, 95. Um, and FOBA Pro, of course, was, uh, was a scandal which went on for a long time. It's extraordinary to hear it still being talked about 21 years later, which gives us an idea about how there are these errors that take place in the past um, that carry forward. I'm not just talking about the, uh, um, uh, the many mistakes I've made in my life, which we won't go into at this point in time. Um, <laughs> I'm talking about you know, these, these, these major errors in macroeconomic policy and economic policy in general, which, which have an impact. Let's hope that there is also this long hangover, positive hangover of the good decisions that have been taken during the, uh, the first two years of this administration in Mexico that will actually bear dividends in the long term. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here with us today. I'd like to thank all of our panelists, even the, the silent panelists um, here. Um, congratulations on the report, gentlemen. Um, thanks very much, Chris, for being here to, to comment. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all at another Wilson Center Mexico Institute event very soon. In fact, tomorrow, if you're interested, we'll be having a ground truth briefing, a, a dial-in conference, uh, where we'll be talking about Mexico's reaction to the incoming Trump administration. Many thanks for being here.